Get your Bibles, turn to the book of Daniel, if you would today. I don't know if you know this or if you realize this, but God, the God of the universe is busy writing a, writing a story. It's an epic story. It's better than any novel that you will ever read. It's better than any Hollywood movie that you will ever watch. It's an epic story of, of failure and redemption. It's an epic love story where the bride walks away from the groom and, 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 and leaves him for another lover, but the groom just continues to pursue and love and forgive the unfaithful bride and, and, and continues to, 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 to pursue that bride with grace and mercy that she doesn't deserve. It's an epic story that is full of intrigue and mystery. <laughs> there's murder, there's conflict, there's war, there's, there are angels and demons, there are displays of miraculous power. It's an epic story of, of this reckless, ruthless villain who, who relentlessly goes after the common people who are in the story and, and, and tries to put them in slavery and bondage, which is the ultimate goal of trying to destroy them. But the story has, this, has a hero and he's the son of a king and the king sends his son into the story to rescue the undeserving people by sacrificing his, his life for them. And, and, and the setting of the story really lies between two kingdoms and two kings, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of, of earth, the kingdom of, of this world and, and the king of this world and, and, and the king of glory. And what makes this epic story so unique and so relevant for us today is that it's, it's real. And, 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 and we're actually participants in the story. And as participants, we actually make a choice of how we will choose to live in the story. We can live as those who belong to the kingdom of earth, trapped in the clutches and the, and the deception of, the, of sin by the villain in the story, Satan, or we can choose to be rescued and saved and set free from, from the bondage that is sin and be rescued by the son of the king, the real hero in the story, the son of God, who is Jesus, who, who is really the central figure of the entire story. And for those of us who have decided and 102 of you did this last week, who, who have decided to receive this rescue and to receive the salvation that we don't deserve. We have now been called to live our lives in allegiance to our new king and his kingdom. You see, when you, when you put your faith and trust in the hero of God's story, Jesus Christ, to be your rescuer and savior, not only did you trade spiritual death for spiritual life, but you traded teams in the store. You, you traded kingdoms, you traded your allegiance, and you actually traded your citizenship. You went from, from being a citizen of this current world to being a permanent citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And even though you are still physically here on this earth, your eternal home is in heaven. And according to the Bible, the world and the culture that we live in, the kingdom of earth, is, is, is vastly different in every way than the kingdom of God. The language, the, the philosophy, the, the lifestyle, the culture of the kingdom of earth, it's just night and day different from the kingdom of God. And as we live in this world, here's what we've been called to do. We've been called to represent our king and to represent his kingdom. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a challenge of epic proportion to live in this world and yet to reflect the values and the principles of another world. Matter of fact, it's, it's, there's a spiritual war going on right now that you can't see. It's being played out above us. That, that it's going on right now and it's designed to pull you back into that world, to, to pull your marriage back into that world, to, in, to, to, to go after your children, to bring the, 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 the values of that world, the philosophy, the lifestyles, to pull your kids into that current world. First Peter chapter two, verse 11, Peter writes, dear friends, he says, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from the worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. So the Bible refers to the followers of Jesus as temporary residents, as foreigners, as strangers, as aliens. We belong to another kingdom and we pledge our allegiance to another king, King Jesus. And so everything about us should reflect that commitment. Our values, our lifestyle, our, our philosophy of life, our, our marriage, how we raise our children, how we engage singleness, our loyalties, where we get our identity, where we find our fulfillment and our joy, it all should represent a commitment to our king and his kingdom. We should act, we should act and think differently than the current world around us. The Bible 
actually describes us as peculiar people. Now, some of you were peculiar before you came to Christ, but now you get to actually embrace that, okay? We should not be overwhelmed. As, 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 as children of this king, as followers of the king, we should not be overwhelmed by the troubles of this world because we belong to another world. We, we've, we've been given everything that we need through the power of God's Holy Spirit to actually live victoriously in this world that we're in. So that, here's what you need to understand. We are not victims. The Bible says we're, we are conquerors, more than conquerors, because we know how the story ends. Our king wins, the enemy is defeated. But until that happens, the Bible tells us that, that in this world, the people of this world are actually going to despise us and hate us. Like millions today and many millions who have gone on before us, we're we're going to be persecuted for living for the king and representing his kingdom. John chapter 17, verse 14, Jesus says, I've given them your word and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. I don't know if you know this, but today there are over 100 million people all over the world who are facing death and persecution for their faith in Jesus Christ. As you know, we have been working in the nation of Cuba since early 2000s. Cuba is a, is a socialistic, communistic country that prohibits the distribution of, of, of God's word. They, they do not be, uh, allow new churches to be planted. They regularly imprison pastors for sharing the gospel. And right now, along with three other churches, we are financially supporting 35 church planting pastors. These guys are warriors who have now planted over 500 churches that preach the gospel in this country. Just in the last several years. These guys, yeah. These guys, these guys face extreme persecution because they have resolved in their hearts to live for a different kingdom. Well, in the Bible, there is an epic story that I believe paints a beautiful picture of the story that God has written for our lives. So the first six chapters of the story, are, they're full of drama and mystery, heroic, uh, heroic courage and miracles. It's an epic story of the past that we love to tell. A young man and his friends, they refused to, to pledge their allegiance to a foreign kingdom and a powerful foreign king. And, and I remember growing up with this story in flannel graphs and lions and fiery furnaces and all of that stuff. Chapter seven, verse 12, they, it actually speaks into the future of this epic story. It's called prophecy. And, and it talks about how our hero Jesus comes and saves the day and offers hope and victory to all who have been set free from the slavery of sin and the bondage of this present world. Well, as we begin this epic journey into the book of Daniel, we are, we're, we are introduced to Daniel when he's a young man. He, he's probably an older teenager. His homeland, Israel, has been conquered by a wicked king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. He has been taken out of his homeland as a hostage. He's been taken to a foreign kingdom, Babylon. He's getting ready to be tested. He and his friends tested in every way to conform to uh, the strange new world that they have been taken to. Now let's jump in and look at how this story begins. Verse one of chapter one, it says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of, of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. So 605 BC, 605 years before Christ, the Babylonians come down from Babylon. They destroy Jerusalem. They take its king. They take all the valuable things from God's temple. And they put them in their own temple where they're worshiping pagan gods. Verse 3. Then, then the king commanded Eshpenaz, the, the, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and, and of nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank, they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, uh, Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. So Ebenezer, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar orders his chief official. I want you to go and I want you to gather up 
uh, young Jewish males and uh, I want royal blood, I want nobility, and I want you to pick the best of the best, guys with no physical defects who are handsome and smart. And Eshvanez picks out a group of four young men, along with some others, out of the tribe of Judah. And out of the tribe of Judah, these four guys, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And Nebuchadnezzar then enrolls them in a three-year program that had a four-step strategy to basically brainwash them to become like the Babylonians. He wanted to get the Jewish out of them and get the Babylonian into them. And his goal was total conformity. So I want to kind of go through this four-step strategy, if, if I could, for a moment. First of all, step one, he wanted to make them learn a new language. The Babylonians, they were, they were big into magic. They were big into rituals and astrology. Nebuchadnezzar knew that the only way that he could get these Jewish men to conform to their pagan religion and to act and think like a Babylonian was to get them to be able to, they had to learn the language first so they could understand everything else. Step two, indoctrinate their minds with a foreign philosophy. Once they were able to understand and read the language, his plan was then to fill their mind with Babylonian philosophy, fill it with science and astrology and and religion. Basically, he wanted to take everything that they had learned about Jewish religion and Jewish culture and replace it with the religious beliefs and values of the Babylonians. Because ultimately he wanted, he wanted to take their devotion away from the God of Israel so that they would be devoted to the pagan gods of, of Babylon. Step three, expose them to a different lifestyle. He wanted to give them a, an appetite for indulgence. He wanted them to 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 only drink the finest wines, only eat the finest foods. He wanted them to have the finest things that the Babylonians had to offer. He wanted them to crave pleasure and indulgence and excess. He wanted them to instill inside of them this need for materialism and self-importance. He wanted to make them narcissists just like he was. Now, one of the problems that these young men immediately encountered was that the food and drink that they were being offered immediately forced them to violate Jewish law. And back at the time, the the Jews were not, they were not to eat or to drink anything prepared by a Gentile. There were probably several types of food on the king's table that was forbidden by law. And and the king's food would have probably actually been been prepared as as a sacrifice to pagan gods. So Nebuchadnezzar, right off the get-go, he wants them to violate God's law. Number four, change their identity and their loyalty. Now, each one of these men, they had been given names by their Jewish parents that had reflected a devotion to the God of Israel. It was obvious that these guys, these four guys were raised in homes where they were taught the Torah, the first five uh, books of the Old Testament. And they were actually taught to to fear God and obey his law. And Nebuchadnezzar's plan was to strip them of their Jewish identity and their loyalty to God. So he had his chief official give them brand new names that had, would identify them from here on out to the pagan gods of Babylonian culture. So Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar, Hananiah to Shadrach, Meshach to Meshach, Azariah to Abednego. So here you have this three-year, four-step plan to brainwash these Jewish males. And again, Nebuchadnezzar's plan is to strip them of their allegiance to their king and his kingdom and to brainwash them into pledging their allegiance to another king and a different kingdom. Are you getting where this story's going? Do you see how this is relevant here? See, we, we are very much like Daniel and his friends. We are strangers in a foreign land. Our homeland is not this earth. The Bible tells us that our citizenship is in heaven. We have been left here to be ambassadors of the kingdom of God. However, we are being bombarded every day by a very compelling culture that speaks a different language, that has, has a different way of thinking, effectively promotes a different lifestyle and constantly challenges us to give up our identities and to trade our loyalty so that we don't look anything like a follower of our king or a citizen of his kingdom. And yet the Bible tells us that we have been called to be different. Even though we live in this world, the Bible tells us that we're not of this world. We've not been called to conform to this world. We've been called to influence this world. We've not been commissioned to follow culture. We've actually been called to change and lead the culture. So how do we do that? How do we, because it's so strong out there. How do we do that? Well, I want you to look at what Daniel did. Now remember, remember King Nebuchadnezzar's four-step strategy. 
But look at verse 8. But Daniel resolved, that's the word, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. By the way, this, this whole story has nothing to do with food and wine. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. Resolve is a, is a firmness of purpose to be separated, having an unwavering firmness of character, action, or will. King James writes it this way, but, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. In other words, Daniel resolved, he, had a, he, he purposed in his heart, he, he made a firm commitment that he would not defile himself by going against God. His allegiance was to another king, a different kingdom. And he resolved that he would not give in to the pressure to conform to the culture around him and, and to violate his commitment to the God of Israel. So he resolved to be different. Now I have to imagine that Daniel and his three friends, I mean, they had to be scared to death at this moment. I mean, these guys, these are normal guys. These are not superheroes with superhuman power. These are normal guys, young men who stood up to the most powerful king of the day. And you need to know Nebuchadnezzar, he's, he's crazy. We're gonna find out that in the next few weeks, but he's a crazy dude. And Babylon was, was the most powerful empire of the day. It would have been nothing for old Neb here to have these guys killed. But with God's strength, Daniel pushed through his fears and resolved in his heart to not defile himself by conforming to the king's plan. He said, how would he be able to do that? Well, there, there were some things that Daniel knew in his heart to be true before the story ever took place. Before we ever get into Daniel 1, there were some things going on in Daniel's life. He was able to do this, but first of all, because he knew who he was. One of the biggest reasons I think we conform to culture, this culture is thrown at us, is because we have no clue who we are. It is totally understandable uh, to, to see people who are not Christians conform to the culture. I mean, they, they belong to this world. I mean, it's natural for them to do that. They don't have the spirit of God living inside of them. So they're going to act like the world. However, it is alarming to see so many people who claim to know Jesus and, and claim to, to belong to him act no different than the world around us. It's hard. I mean, it's hard as a pastor to see so many believers struggle with self-esteem problems and low self-confidence, longing for someone to fill a void in their life that can only be filled by Jesus. And yet it's common. You go, how could that happen? How do generations of, of young people, generations even of, of adults who, 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 who supposedly follow Jesus Christ, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, how do we grow up with severe self-esteem problems, with very little self-respect and low self-confidence to the point we just get sucked in and fall, pray to the culture around us? I believe it's because there's just way too many believers who have no idea of who they really are in Christ, what the gospel says about them every single day. And so we have this identity crisis going on and we forget sometimes that we've actually been adopted into God's own family. We are actually sons and daughters of the King. We sometimes forget that God purchased our freedom from the power of sin when he gave his son Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. And now we've been given access full access into the presence of God. The Bible says we can walk in there with, with full confidence. And we've been granted God's own unlimited power through the Holy Spirit. And we forget sometimes how God loves us. He created us to love us. And he actually now, he says, you used to be my enemies, but now I call you my friends. Here's what Daniel knew. He knew he worshiped the one true God. He knew that he, that he was from God's chosen nation, Israel. He also knew, knew that he was from the tribe of Judah. The tribe of Judah was, an, was a tribe of incredible blessing. When, when Jacob in Genesis blessed his 12 sons, they become the, the, 12, the 12 tribes of Israel. He put a powerful word of blessing on his son, Judah. Jacob's blessing was, that, that was a prophecy that said that out of Judah's descendants would come royalty. You say, who were those descendants? King David, King Solomon, boom, 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 all the way down to King Jesus. And Daniel knew he was an Israelite. He, he knew that, that Israel was God's chosen people. They were a nation of blessing. They were a people that belonged to God. And in the face of tremendous pressure to conform, Daniel knew that not only did he come from a family of blessing, but he also came from a nation of blessing. And I get this a lot. And just so you're wondering, I still believe that Israel is a nation of blessing. Okay, I just want you to know how, where, I, where I am with that. God's chosen people. But 
Today, we are part of that plan. We, 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 are, we are part of God's chosen people. We are a people of blessing. Romans eleven seventeen 17 tells us that now we're, we're part of God's overall blessing plan. In other words, because, G, because of Jesus, God has made us his very own. We've been grafted into the story. We are sons and daughters of the creator of the universe. First Peter chapter two, nine, the first part of it says, but you're not like that. You're not like who the, the, the world over here, but for you are a chosen people, a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. And when you understand the depth of what it means to be one of God's chosen people and that you belong to God himself, you will realize that it's actually kind of cool to be peculiar in this world, to be a little different out there. It's actually kind of appealing to feel different because you realize I don't need to conform to the culture because I have a call on my life to change the culture. I've been empowered to lead the culture. And when you know who you are in God's eyes, it, it'll shape your behavior and it gives you a sense of, of confidence and self-respect, not, in your, not so much in yourself, but in, in Jesus. Daniel also knew who, what his purpose was in life. The second part of 1 Peter 2, 9 says, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God for he has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, when you have a good grasp on who you are, it makes it a lot easier to know why you're here. Why am I here? He just said it. We're here to show others the goodness of God and to help lead them out of spiritual darkness into spiritual light. And Daniel may not have known what he was going to be when he grew up. He didn't know maybe what his profession was gonna be, but he didn't struggle with his life's purpose. Daniel was committed to live his life for an audience of one, the, true, the one true God of Israel. You say, how was he able to do that? He knew why he had been put on earth. He also knew the source of his strength. He was able to resolve in his heart not to defile himself because he knew God was in control and he knew that he could handle whatever came his way because he knew his strength came from God. Peter keeps writing in, in 1 Peter 2, he says, once you had no identity as a people, now you're God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you receive God's mercy. Oh, such great promises. See, you don't have to struggle with the pressures to conform to culture when you know who you are, when you know why you're here and, and where your strength comes from. Our strength comes from the Holy Spirit of God that is living inside and through us. Over, over the many years, the last several years, actually, I, I've watched so many professed Christ followers today just, I mean, lose their minds and become completely overwhelmed by the state of politics in our country. It, you, here, here's the thing. You don't have to live overwhelmed when you know that this world is not your home. You don't have to worry about the future or the unknown when you know who you are, why you're here and where your strength comes from. And I know some people go, yes, but, but what if, what if, what if, what if so-and-so gets elected? What if he gets elected or she gets elected or whatever? Listen, our first and foremost allegiance is to a different king and a different kingdom. Please, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I love this country. I would die for this country if called upon. But my first and foremost allegiance is not to America, it's to the kingdom of God. I'm just grateful that I get the chance to live in America and that God has given me the opportunity and responsibility to live out my freedoms with, 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 just with freedom, the freedom I have in Christ, with freedom, and, to, and then to go to other places and to tell people about Christ. Daniel also knew how to connect to that source. He knew how to connect to the source of his strength. Daniel is famous for being a man of prayer. Daniel 6 tells us that three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed to God. His faith to live for God, even under the most adverse circumstances, flowed out of an intimate relationship with the Lord. He knew where his strength came from. So how can we do, how can we do this? How can we live resolved to be different in, in this crazy world that's so powerful and compelling? Four things, real quick. First of all, a resolve to be different is developed in the home. Daniel's courage and strength to be, to be resolved, it didn't just appear out of, out of nowhere and he, when he was standing in front of Nebuchadnezzar. No, this, this courage, this courage, this resolve, it was built at the breakfast table of his home in Jerusalem when he was a young boy. This resolve was developed in, in, in his living room in the evening 
with his parents and maybe even some grandparents and maybe some others that were pouring into his life. It was developed by, by these godly parents and godly grandparents who began pouring God's word into Daniel's life when he was a young, at a young age. There had to have been some investment of time and focus into Daniel's spiritual growth at a young age. Because remember, he's a young man. He's a, he's a, a teenager in this story. And we don't, even, we don't know Daniel's parents' names. God didn't think it was that important. Otherwise, it would be in there. But I have to believe that they had prepared Daniel to be unwavering in his commitment to God, probably knowing that someday it would be put to the test. Listen, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of teaching your children the tremendous riches and blessings that they have in their relationship with Jesus Christ by teaching them, instilling, pouring God's word into their hearts. You need to teach your children their identity in Christ, their purpose in life, their source of their strength and how to connect to that source. You know, I know, you know, as a culture, we, we stick this age of 18 out there. You know, man, when you're 18, you're on your own. When you're 18, you are a man or a woman. You're 18, you can vote, you can do all this stuff. And, and we think sometimes, man, you're 18, you're good to go. 18 is not in the Bible. Some of your kids aren't ready to be thrown out into some college out there. They're just not ready. I mean, they, they, they mean a few more years at home because they're not quite ready for it. And yet we're like, well, wait a minute, they're 18. I'm gonna miss out on the Hope Scholarship. Really? There's more going on here than that. There, there, there's a deeper story going on here than that. Sometimes we, have to, we may have to make some serious sacrifices and going, they, they will never do well at that school and I'm gonna have to forget, forego that scholarship and put them over here at this school, in this Christian school where they have godly teachers, godly professors. I'm not saying that that's the way you have to go, but I'm just telling you that we need to look at our kids and say, what's the best for their future? And in this age 18, that we need to get that out of our mind and go, where, what's the best thing for our son, our daughter right now? It has broken my heart to watch kids grow up in our church in godly homes, get thrown out into a college with professors that, are, that just are smarter than them are waiting for them to walk in their classroom and they derailed them. Some of our best kids have walked away from Christ because they weren't ready for that. They weren't ready for that kind of, of, of onslaught. And I'm asking you to think through that and pre really prepare your kids. And once they get to that place, are they ready? And make a decision and trust God. Trust God with that decision that you feel is best for your kids. All right, but it's got to start. It's got to start at a young age. It's got to start at the breakfast table, in the living room. The second thing we need to do is you need to understand is that godly inner convictions can overcome any outer pressure. Let me tell you what happens in this story. I'm going to finish chapter one here. God gives Daniel favor in the eyes of Nebuchadnezzar's chief of staff. And he tells Daniel, he says, listen, I'm scared to death of Nebuchadnezzar. He's crazy. And, and if he sees that you are weak and pale because you have refused his food and you will not drink his wine, he will have me beheaded. And Daniel says, okay, test me and my friends for three days, or excuse me, my three friends for 10 days. Give us only water and vegetables. And if we do not look better than the rest of the guys who are in the king's meal program, then you just do what you want with us, all right? And the Bible tells us that the official, he agrees to Daniel's terms. Now, how could Daniel and his friends put their lives on the line like that? I mean, why not just drink the wine and the food? I mean, it obviously had to be really good, right? Because Daniel knew that God was in control. And because of that, he knew God would see him through. He, he resolved in his heart to be different. Daniel literally threw his life on the line. He put God's reputation on the line because he knew he could trust God. I've, I've, I've given you this quote many times before. I'm gonna throw it out to you again. It's one of my favorites. I, I think about it all the time. God takes complete responsibility for a life that's totally yielded to him. Charles Stanley. Number three. God honoring obedience leads to God-given rewards. Verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided uh, for the others. And God gave these four young men an unusual ap aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. In other words, God came through. After 10 days, of drinking water and just eating vegetables. Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than all of the other young men in the king's program. This is where some of you get the Daniel fast from. 
As a result, these guys, they're, they're smarter than everyone else. And God gives Daniel a special ability to interpret visions and dreams. Look at verse 20. When the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom and balanced judgment, he found them 10 times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in the entire, entire kingdom. Listen, I'm just telling you, there's something about obedience that is connected to blessing, not just in this earth, but in the earth to come, in the world to come. Number four, don't conform to the culture or attack the culture. Instead, lead and change the culture. Verse 18, 19, let me read this. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar and the king talked with them and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah and they entered the royal service. In other words, Daniel and his buddies, they're promoted to be insiders in the king's palace. Now you may disagree with what I'm about to say, but I think as believers, we have made two big mistakes when it comes to confronting the culture we live in. One, we have tried to conform to the culture and it's made us just look like a bunch of hypocrites. We've lost respect. We've lost our ability to make an impact because we're no different than anyone else. They don't see the difference. It's not attractive. It doesn't draw them into the light because they don't see the light. Number two, we've attacked the culture. And that, all that's done is make us look angry and self-righteous and we've lost influence. Westridge, rather than conform to the culture or attack the culture, we need to engage the culture. We need to lead the culture so we can influence and impact the culture. We need to show the goodness of God. We need to put his love and grace on display. The Lord says, it is, it is my kindness that leads people to repentance. We need to raise up some culture changers, some leaders in our homes who will go out and change and impact the culture, engage it, not conform to it. He's given us a mission to tell the world about our King. He's called us to be difference makers in, the, in, in our current world, to raise them up in our home and to send them out. But first we must resolve in our hearts right now that we will pledge our allegiance first and foremost to God's kingdom and to our King, King Jesus. And that we will teach our children when they are young to be unwavering, resolved in their commitment to Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you. Thank you for stories like this one. Epic stories of real young men who through your strength and power resolved to be different. They knew who they were. They, they knew their purpose in life. They knew where their strength come from. They knew exactly how to draw from that strength. Lord, it's just like Jesus being in the wilderness. How was he able, Lord, to, to, to handle the onslaught of Satan who, who tempted him in every way? It's because he knew who he was. He knew what his purpose was in life. He knew where the, the, his strength came from and knew how to access it. Father, may we have that same, that same understanding and may we resolve in our hearts to be different today to push against the culture, not to conform to it, to, to, to engage it with love and grace and mercy, not to attack it. May you make the people of this church influencers. May we raise them in our home. May we be leaders in our community and may we raise leaders in our homes. Give us the strength and power every single day to know that we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. The resurrection didn't end last week. It lives inside of us today. We have that access to that power every day. Help us to be resolved, Lord.